On Sunday, December 7, 1958, around 1 p.m., the Martin family gathered into their 1954 cream and red colored Ford station wagon and headed towards the Columbia River Gorge. Their intention was to collect greenery from the surrounding woodlands to use for Christmas decorations around their home. Three hours later, the family stopped at a gas station in the city of Cascade Locks, 40 miles from their home, where they ate at Paradise Snack Bar in the city of Hood River, 20 miles further from Cascade Locks. So at this point, they were about 60 miles from home. Their waitress at Paradise Snack Bar confirmed that all appeared normal with the family and they left the restaurant around 5 p.m., which was already found weird by many, as Ken Martin was known to avoid driving at night due to his eyesight. This was the last time any sightings of the Martin family could be verified. On December 9th, Ken's boss reported him missing, as he had not shown up to work, something that was extremely out of character for him. That same night at around 11 p.m., police arrived at the home of the Martin family. There were no signs of a break-in or foul play. There were dishes still in the sink and a load of clothing was still in the washing machine, and a Santa Claus outfit from a Christmas party was even still laid out on a bed. Wherever the Martins had gone, they clearly intended to come back. Within days, their disappearance was all over the papers, and as many as five different police agencies all launched separate investigations to find the family. Police were able to verify that the family stopped at the gas station and the restaurant, but after that, they were at a loss for where the family could have gone. During the course of the initial search, the police found an abandoned white Chevy near Cascade Locks, which was from Los Angeles and had been reported stolen by its owner. This led police to search for two ex-convicts, Roy Light and Lester Price. There was some suspicion that the two may have been involved in the disappearance of the Martins, as the owner of the Paradise Snack Bar told the police that they were at the restaurant at the same time as the Martin family, leaving shortly after the Martins. But without substantial proof to connect them to the disappearance, they were never questioned. Strangely, days after their disappearance, police would continue to get calls reporting sightings of the Martins from all over the area. Several alleged witnesses claimed to see the Martins or people matching their description in other parts of Oregon, Iowa, and even Montana, but none of these sightings could be verified. Two witnesses claimed to see the Martin station wagon around dusk parked under the Bridge of the Gods in Cascade Locks with two men standing next to the vehicle and speaking to the passengers inside, though this couldn't be verified. But if it was true, this was the last known time they were seen alive. Many came to believe that they had accidentally driven into the Columbia River. Pretty soon though, a very important discovery in the investigation was made when tire tracks were found leading to a cliff above the river and cream-colored paint chips consistent with the color of the Martin station wagon were found on the rocks below. The location of the tracks suggested that an accident was unlikely as the spot was not close to the road. Efforts to search this portion of the river though proved fruitless when two police officers shot down the idea, claiming it was too dangerous and that no divers should be sent down there even though Detective Walter Graven was told by two professional divers that this would be a good place to dive and anyone who knows how to dive would have no trouble in this area. In the early morning of May 2nd, 1959, a fisherman and his wife reported something strange floating downstream near the Bonneville Dam in the Columbia River Gorge near Portland, Oregon. To them, it appeared to be two bodies, and unfortunately, they were right. The following day, one of the bodies was found on the north bank of the Columbia River, and the next morning, the second body was recovered. They belonged to Susan and Virginia Martin, ages 11 and 13. Though the official cause of death for both girls was determined to be drowning, a technician reportedly spotted what he believed to be bullet wounds in each of their heads and informed Dr. Waterman, the medical examiner. In his report, however, Waterman stated that no such injuries were found. Likewise, no police reports or newspaper articles from the time indicated that any signs of foul play were present. The examination also revealed that both Virginia and Susan had eaten burgers and fries within two hours of their deaths, consistent with the testimony of the waitress from Paradise Snack Bar. Dr. Waterman claimed to have received several threatening phone calls after the bodies had been discovered. Each time, the voice of what sounded like a young man warned Dr. Waterman that he would be harmed should any of the other missing Martins be identified. But there was actually one surviving member of the Martin family, Donald Martin. Donald had a strained relationship with his family due to him possibly being gay and having been caught with a man in the home by his parents. He never came out to aid in the search for his parents and sisters, claiming that his aunt Charlotte had encouraged him to stay put in New York. However, Charlotte refuted this claim, stating that she didn't understand why Donald hadn't traveled to Oregon to help look for his family. 
Donald also didn't attend the memorial services for either of his sisters, claiming to have gotten the dates mixed up. As the only surviving family member, Donald was the sole beneficiary of the Martin estate, totaling around $36,000 at the time. Four years earlier, Donald had been fired from his job at the Meyer and Frank, a department store in Portland. He had been fired for stealing over $2,000 worth of merchandise. One theory suggests that Donald had some involvement in the disappearance of his family, not just because of his poor relationship with his family. No, there was something much worse that came up. A 38 automatic pistol covered in blood was discovered under a rock near Cascade Locks in January 1959. A single spent bullet was found in the chamber of the gun. Bizarrely, the weapon was never processed as evidence and was later cleaned and returned to the man who found it. When investigators traced the gun's serial number, they learned it was one of the items Donald Martin was accused of stealing from Meyer and Frank back in 1954. Despite this, Donald was never outwardly accused of having any involvement in the disappearances. To this day, Ken, Barbara, and Barbie Martin's bodies remain unfound, along with their vehicle. The next case is much more modern, and follows a young girl named Kanika Jenkins. On September 8, 2007, Kanika told her mother she was going out with some friends. She lied and said they were going bowling and then to see a movie to celebrate her getting a job at a nursing home. Kanika borrowed her mother Teresa's car and left the house around 11 p.m. That was the last time Teresa saw her daughter alive. Kanika was born on May 27, 1998 in Chicago. She was a smart and responsible girl with a bright future according to friends and family, and she had a very good relationship with her mother. The night in question, Kanika and her three friends actually went to a party on the ninth floor of the Crown Plaza Chicago O'Hare Hotel in Rosemont, Illinois. The group could be seen entering the hotel around 1 a.m. through security footage. The friends posted videos to their Snapchat stories and Facebooks during the party, but they were clearly not having a good time, stating that the males were aggressively flirting with them even after telling them to back off. At around 1.30 a.m., Kanika sent a final text to her sister, the last time her family would ever hear from her. Around 3 a.m., the girls decided to leave the party. In the hotel lobby, Kanika realized she had left her belongings, car keys, and cell phone back in the room. Kanika's friends left her alone to go retrieve her belongings since Kanika was too intoxicated to even walk straight, but this was a terrible idea. The group returned to where they had left Kanika, and she was gone. The friends searched the hotel trying to find her, but had no luck. Between 4 and 4.30 a.m., they decided to call her mother Teresa to let her know they couldn't find her daughter. They asked if Kanika had maybe gone home without them. When they learned that she hadn't, they drove to Teresa's house and brought her back to the hotel to continue searching. Teresa didn't believe Kanika's friend's story, and she could tell that they had been drinking and were possibly under the influence of drugs. When she asked Kanika's friends if she had anything to drink, they told her that she had one drink. Kanika's mother grew extra worried because she knew Kanika couldn't handle alcohol and even a single drink would be too much for her. She asked the hotel's front desk for help, but they refused. She requested to see the security footage or for a security officer to look at it to figure out where her daughter had gone, but they told her only the police could look at the tapes. At 7.15 a.m., Teresa called 911 about her missing daughter, but at this time, the dispatcher told her that Kanika was probably passed out drunk in a random hotel room and to go home, relax, and give it till morning. The next day, Kanika was officially reported as missing, and a police investigation began around 1.15 p.m. the next day, on September 9th. Hotel staff claimed they looked at the security footage and didn't see anything, oddly enough, and you're about to hear why. Police searched the hotel and surrounding areas, but came up with nothing. Around 10 p.m., an officer decided to look back through the security tapes in case something was missed. Sure enough, he discovered Kanika stumbling around the hallways of the hotel lobby around 3.20 a.m., and she was so intoxicated that she could hardly walk. After this, the police sent out a second search team to follow her last known steps. After stumbling her way through multiple floors and hallways, Kanika found her way to a kitchen that was under renovation and not in use. The last known footage shows her walking through this kitchen back towards the freezer. This freezer had a cooler in front, with a second door leading to the freezer area. The video does not show her walking into the freezer, but it's speculated she opened the door, walked in, and never came out. Police found her frozen solid dead body inside of the freezer. Others speculate that the hotel had something to do with her death, and that her placement in the freezer is a cover-up. Some people believe she was lured into the freezer by someone working at the hotel and locked her in. 
Some say she was killed off camera, put in a black garbage bag, and dumped into the freezer to make it look like she stumbled into the freezer on her own. A lot of people believe the hotel might have had a motive to cover up whatever happened to her because the party being held at the hotel was paid for using stolen credit cards and there was underage drinking and illegal drugs inside the room. The hotel knew about the party as they had received several noise complaints but did nothing to stop it. Was the hotel trying to hide the truth about Kanika's death so they wouldn't get in trouble for having an illegal party at their hotel? Or was her death simply an accident? Perhaps more details may come to surface one day that may give a definitive answer.